Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Friday's edition of the Q Files. It's the 19th of June, the year is 2009. By the way, this is a live show. This has not been pre-recorded tonight. Uh, we're blessed to have Russ Dizar on, who is probably, in my opinion, the man that God has raised up to, to teach and train the body of Christ how to fight, literally, in the realm of the Spirit. Russ has got a tremendous website. It's linked to on my website, but it's called Shatter the darkness.net shatter s h a t t e r the darkness.net we're going to get right into the interview because russ is uh, gracious enough to come on on short notice and we're going to talk about the black awakening and what it is and how it's going to affect our lives hi russ hi steve great thanks uh, great to be with you tonight well i got to tell you something just going on your website in the last 24 hours man are you are you at the right place at the right time? And it's amazing. After 15 years, Russ, on talk radio, now this is absolutely dropped, I believe, if, by the direction of the Holy Spirit to warn, to equip, to prepare God's people to fight the fight in the spirit realm that most people don't even know exists. What is the Black Awakening? Well, that is, um, it is a concept that an that a underground Satanist, a really highly trained uh, military side, Satanist uh, conveyed to me years ago, and I checked on it years and years uh, after that with many of the other um, folks that we've worked with. It's their terminology. It's their concept of a coming massive anarchy chaos that they have been plotting for 60 years, that they've been working. This flows from the old Nazi regime to this very day. They believe in a new world order, a new globalism, but they've got to create massive chaos, massive anarchy to collapse society, economic the economic side, uh, the power grids, the the food uh, chain, uh, to literally collapse the United States in order to make room for the rise of the Antichrist, in their view, and the rise of globalism. And uh, they're very committed to it, very lethal in their in their um, approach to it. Uh, they have uh, they're as cold as can be when it comes to uh, their discussions of how they're going to take people out, resistors in the midst of the chaos. And when the dust clears, their belief is they will be able to freely uh, develop this new world order. Well, you write extensively and do a massive amount of broadcasting on your own. Let's talk about what it is in the spiritual realm that the weapons, you know, we're told that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God. And obviously most Christians are unaware of psi warriors, they're unaware of, would you kind of give us a short overview of how these entities have basically utilized a lot of the occultic ways of basically waging psychic warfare? Sure. They, I believe through technology, I think, again, communicated from the demonic side um, as far back as the Nazis, back into the infiltration of U.S. government. Their, um, you know, the ideas that have popped into their heads and come into their minds to develop technologies, well, as far back as the late 1940s on how to split the core of a human being, create sub-personalities to become soldiers, assassins, uh, they have, uh, well, they've, they've always been looking for the super soldier, but I think that it's connected, Steve, to the end game in Revelation 19.19, 19, where Antichrist has his army on the field, the world's largest, most empowered, supernaturally charged, technologically advanced, you know, military on the field, prepared to, to release what I would, what I would say that by that time, would be planetary, they would look at it as planetary defense weapons in the return, the visible return of the living Christ. So the development uh, doesn't happen overnight. It's been occurring in an incremental approach. These Psy warriors um, seek to obtain not only just telekinesis and clairvoyance and, and the power to project harm, even... Um, changing the mind of other individuals. At Fort Bragg, they had the goat lab where, you know, psi warriors were trained to uh, use their powers to explode the heart of a goat in preparation to use it in, you know, the weaponization. And I'd call it the weaponization of demonic powers. They might see the psi powers, but when you get down to it, especially in deliverance sessions, they understand the energy but they don't understand that energy is connected to an entity that they've allowed to come in and uh, enhance humanity, in their view anyway, 
Uh, and uh, just like Mark chapter 5, where the man had superhuman strength, it won't be the first time that military systems, I mean, all the way back in the Old Testament, there's a king that sacrificed his own son on the wall to obtain powers to defeat Israel in a battle. And uh, that kind of thing, I believe, has been going on underground in the secret power of lawlessness for years upon years. We've engaged ritual stuff. We've engaged ritual warfare. So not only do they have it on a personal level, they do it in a uh, corporate level. And I believe that this has this has gained, uh, in the last 20 years even, um, immensely. They understand spiritual warfare. They're not a target in sin powers. They call it blitzkrieg or lightning warfare. Uh, and they believe that's what will help um, when this great chaos comes. It's it's all a, a burst of, of powers uh, that they will unleash at the same time and uh, help. Literally all hell them. breaking loose at the same time. And now isn't that interesting that the Masons, as you know, uh, better than anybody, that basically their ordo ad chaos, they have to have this chaos. But everybody thinks just in the natural realm, Russ, and that's why I'm, right. I'm really blessed to have you on, and I'm, I'm thankful that the audience is going to get a blessing to ponder this, because they only think in the terms of what they can see, the natural realm. But in what you're dealing with, you're dealing in the psychic warfare. By the way, just ladies and gentlemen, one of my best friends was trained at Fort Bragg in the GOAT lab, and the interesting thing is, is uh, Russ and I talked off the air uh, uh, under... Uh, uh, what was it, uh, Michael Aquino, and for the 1st Earth Battalion, and uh, he validated what Russ is saying. And guess what, Russ? He was kicked out of the program when they saw him saying grace. Interesting, huh? Very interesting. And that I've heard that again and again because they, they, they know that that presence of Christ, um, even in the weakest of believers, is is contrary to what they need for reception of their powers, their development, and... Um, and it's incremental. I mean, they, they get, they, you know, that's just like a satanic ritual or a satanic coven. They bring people in, in, in an incremental way. Little by little initiation, you're, you're taking one step at a time until you're so deep in, uh, in that darkness and power that, uh, you're shrouded in what they've called the black flame. And it's all about that, Steve. And I, and I've, I've done a series that I, that I think is important that, all the globalism, there is no globalism without the spirit uh, behind that globalism. Absolutely. And, I, you know, and, and uh, Hawk, my co-host, and I, we just call that Luciferianism, okay? You right. cannot separate it. And that's what, that's what I don't think people can grasp. In, in your estimation, with all the people you've talked to, I think we spoke, you have talked to over 200 people in this world that have validated it, I think uh, people need to know, Russ, in your opinion, how many people have been tampered with that, you, and, and, you know, this is basically based on what you know. How many millions of people now are walking around on this earth, in your opinion, that have been tampered with? My definition of tampered is what you're calling, you know, initiated into or mind-controlled or, or given an alternative personality. Um, it's astounding. It really is. And this is what really needs to grip a lot of us. Uh, they say now, as far as diagnosed cases, and this is the ones that have broken down, 4.5 million. Uh, there's others that estimate, like Colin Ross, he's a world-renowned psychiatrist out of, out of uh, Canada. He wrote a book called Pro Project Bluebird, uh, Bluebird, and the subtitle is The Purposeful Creation of uh, Multiple Personality Disorder. It is not a mental disease. It is a purposely you know, created, you know, done thing to create what they believe is an enhanced human, and he estimates 10 million, and I agree with him. In 1994, we did a seminar, and out of all the people we dealt with that came from psychiatric centers that have been diagnosed, that have been put on the books, half of the people that we deal with, even to this very day, have never been to a psych ward, never been diagnosed. They are intact, Steve. They, they, they are intact and not breaking down. They're prepared as sleepers. So I'm going to tell you, I personally, my opinion, there's at least another 4.5 to 5 million uh, of what they call chosen ones that are sleepers waiting for the trigger, waiting to be released, which involves not just the programming to a subpersonality, in it, but it involves when that subpersonality comes to the surface, powerful demonic presence um, will come with that, and they will be 
um, almost unstoppable. And uh, they they will, you can't talk them out of it. Uh, we've found that when we've triggered them or when they've been sent and been triggered here, I was in a federal officer's home, and uh, his wife was one of these individuals and asked me to step into another room to talk to me, and instantly, as I'm looking at her, I knew it was coming, the Spirit of God said, she's going to stab you. I mean, in a second, uh, she switched to another personality called Iris. The eyes, everything changed, the demeanor. Just like we can feel the manifestation of the Spirit of God, they can manifest powerful demonic force. And she attacked and attempted uh, to, to, to stab me. She had a six-inch needle under her little sash. Uh, it turned into a big deliverance session. Her federal officer husband didn't even, he, he saw something and this power encounter where we had to command the demonic presence out. It was a battle. Um, it totally, I mean, he just fell to the ground in tears after what he saw. And that was only one of the episodes of this one individual. They're lethal, Steve. They really are. Well, you know, Russ, and again, when I came to know Jesus, and you and I spoke about this, I've been involved in that world, and unless people have really seen, not the not the phony psychobabble stuff, but I'm talking the real thing, mm-hmm. and you're immediately confronted with a supernatural evil that, number one, defies description, number two, basically melts your mind, but number three, is subject to the name and the blood of Jesus. Now, this is important for people to, to understand, because when Jesus said, you know, uh, Behold, he gives us power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And by the way, isn't it amazing? That's the beasts that show up in the book of Revelation. He's not kidding. Why is the church, in your opinion, because obviously you're a pastor, you've, you, you, you've uh, you know, preached at different churches, you've had training sessions all over. Why are Christians so terrified of this because, I mean, in essence, it comes with the territory. If you're a believer in Jesus, I mean, immediately from, from a redeemed pagan, I was thrust into that world. And I can tell you this, that when there's no one else to stand with you in this world, Jesus will stand with you. But why is it, Russ, that, that, that this is taboo or basically just avoided like the plague? Well, I think it's partly because we've only been, we've been, we've been discipled with about one-fourth of the of the training that we should have had as normal stuff from, from day one. That's my big thing that I've seen all over in churches where I've pastored. When I've done conferences, I'll ask, how many here know the authority of Christ? And maybe maybe a fourth will raise their hand. How many know you have that uh, authority and can use that? And it's only used for one thing, to trample the dark powers. And it's And, it, and you're correct. These powers are great, they're, they're mighty, they, they, they operate, there's nothing else that contests them until they're encountered. Uh, there's one thing that I've learned from the demonic realm, from listening to them scream and yell at me over the year through people, over all these years, is they don't care about Muhammad, Buddha, Quetzalcoatl, they don't fear any of that. But when Jesus is brought to them, the Christ of Scripture, and they're confronted with the living Christ, they know, Steve, they know him, they t- they're terrified of him. They know the judgment is coming, and it's very clear that authority is so powerful; it's devastating to them. And but it's the only thing that that can confront them. Do you think that's um, why, too, Russ, that the mainstream church has been, if you will, mind controlled or demonically influenced to the point where they will not use the name of Jesus? Okay, and and I, I said when I talk on uh, different radio programs across the country, I say, you know, it's amazing. You can use any name in the world, even make up names, but at the name of Jesus, everything stops because it's like the the demons that are, the devils that are, the powers that be. That they, I mean, they as you know, they don't even call him Jesus. They'll call him the Nazarene or the Demiurge or whatever they you know so flippantly uh, uh, blaspheme the name of the the God of Heaven. But the point is, is that that name of Jesus. Here, here's something: if Christians cannot embrace the name of their Savior, then it's obvious to me, and I want your feedback on this, they cannot embrace the authority that he's given them over the powers of darkness. Well, I agree. I agree. The name and the authority and his presence and his power, his grace, all of it's its all one thing. You can't separate. Uh, there's so much that flows from, again, we're talking, we're talking now God in human flesh. Uh, all of creation listened to Jesus and obeyed him when he told the winds and the waves to stop. Disease stopped, sin was cleansed, and the demons, if not Satan himself, um, were blasted. 
death itself was conquered. So we're dealing with the singularity of uh, you know power, uh, uh, and we're, we're dealing with the infinite over the over the finite. And the church has been dumbed down, truly has since the 60s. Uh, there was a, the, a an occult historian, James Webb, wrote the second greatest proliferation of occult literature released in history was uh, well, the first was in pre-Nazi Germany, the second was in the 60s in the United States. And I think from that time, there's been such a spiritual frog in the kettle approach to bring this this weakening of the church. Uh, because you can go to church, go through everything, walk away, and not experience God see his power. That's not that's unheard of in the early church. You look at Acts chapter 4. God was all over the church. And the power of God was there. And the people, the pagan folks that were into the demonic presence, they were worried that these believers were coming to turn the world upside down. So there's a great difference. And it's not that we can't get back. I mean, Jesus is the same yesterday, today. But if creation is sustained by him and listens to him, uh, it's incredible that we don't... Programs are not going to save the United States of America. Uh, it's the power of God through the living Christ. Uh, this, he's bigger than the planet, bigger than the universe. And the name that he's been given, as you've mentioned, Steve, is... is um, Every elect angel in heaven bows. Uh, we read in the Psalms where in the council of the gods, small g, Yahweh, God is feared. I mean, they, they, there's just such a vast difference. Right. And, and, you know, it's interesting because in the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. But you cannot even begin to, how do I say this, acknowledge your position as a redeemed child of the king until you understand that there is, that all creation bows before the living God. You know, Russ, doing talk radio, people don't get it that their only hope for deliverance, their only hope for for eternal life is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask you this. Go into detail about the gentleman that did the work that you uh, spoke to me about last night on the splitting of personalities, because, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the most amazing thing. Would you share that with the listening audience? Sure. And, and, and many in the audience might have heard, you know, over news and television and news shows, whatever, about multiple personality disorder. That's the psychological term. They've changed it now to dissociative identity disorder. Um, what's, what's happened since the 70s, and it never occurred in the 60s and the 50s, but it started in the 70s, then thousands came in the 80s, then, then hundreds of thousands in the 90s, showing up at psych wards everywhere because they've heard voices inside, they switched other personalities, the psychological community could not get a hold of this at first. Billions of dollars being spent on insurance to try to help this issue. Well, here's what it all goes back to. Once we begin to deal with these folks for years, we began purposely in the 80s. Track it. Let's go all the way back to the origins of the source. We can go back to 1947 when G.H. Estabrooks, a world-renowned psychiatrist, uh, he was head of the American Psychological Association, he was hired by the CIA. He wrote a little book that I've, I've got. You can barely get it any longer. It's called Hypno Hypnotism. And in there, there's a chapter called The Weaponization of Hypn uh, Hypnosis, in which he discusses the trauma-based splitting of the human core. Like, you and I have one personality. But when they can go in, and it, you, it, again, it, it basically starts in childhood because it's easier. But you literally go in to create a level of like, well, you and I can call it daydreaming, we're, we're dissociating off. Well, it's like they stretch the sub-personality, or the, the personality of a person, uh, which I think Scripture calls the suke, the solical side of us, so far to where there's a snapping. Many will say that's part of a, a protective element to kind of whoever's being abused, you know, they split. The, the part of them that takes the abuse after it's done goes down like a beach ball, buried deep down in their conscience. They come back to the surface not remembering what occurred. Well, that's a simple way of explaining how they have learned to purposely do this. In 1947, U.S. military had already known how to split personality and create sub-personalities that could be trained. Some for reconnaissance in other nations like spies, some to sow disinformation among groups, some to be assassins. They created, back then, Steve, um, personalities that could be 
down, buried down below, separate personality. The upfront person say his name is Joe. He doesn't even know. He's what they've called amnesic. They're, they've made it this way so that Joe, if he's ever captured by the enemy, can't be interrogated or nothing can come from him because Joe doesn't know. But the sub-personality, uh, Bob, underneath, uh, that, that has been trained in lethal uh, you know, assassination, uh, obtaining secret documents, whatever it is, um, that's who holds the memory, the knowledge, and interrogators can't get to him. We've seen this in even serial killers that were part of the programs. Uh, a number of the serial murders who slaughtered women, they are multiples. They have sub-personalities. Again, tracking them backwards, they've all come out of uh, military background. Um, so what we've found now, now that it's 60-some years later, we've, we've engaged people that have a 100 sub-personalities inside or more. And each one is different. Uh, one could be used simply for compromising, you know, coming up and compromising people sexually. That's all they know. One could be, uh, again, an assassin. One could be trained in, in chemicals or poisons. One could be trained in explosives. Another could be in trained in, in information or being an informer. If anything's occurring to the main person, they know the handler to call, and the, they can come in and retrieve the person and kind of stop the leakage. and um, But then when you got, here's what occurs. They split the personality. They, they do, secondly, a thing called bonding. The, the new raw personality, they're basically telling it, you know, we created you, you are ours, you know, we, we, we're, we're, you know, your creators. And then they begin to program. And there's sophisticated ways. The basic sense is they're simply imposing sophisticated will or agenda or a job into that sub-personality. And I've been told by the people that do that over the years, Russ, that they can actually almost like batch process it in, too. Sure. They develop it to, in other words, it's not like they have to do it sentence by sentence, precept by precept. Mm -hmm. They have so, uh, in some cases, even genetically altered these individuals. Now, let me ask you a question because this is critical. Where is in your study and what the Lord has led you to in this whole field, where is, though, the uh, actual demon possession of spirit entities that inhabit the people? I mean, is there a point when, let's say, the split person, I, because I've, I've encountered the real, as you have, real demons, okay? And when real demons are speaking to me in an esoteric language, and fortunately, in one case, I happen to know a couple words, and, 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 and seriously, the thing was speaking to me that was being cast out in that language, and I said, in Jesus' name, stop uh, speaking to me in Urdu. And the thing said, oh, a wise Christian. And, and seriously, it went from the language, okay, right into the mocking spirit. I don't know if you've ever encountered that. Yeah, we've had that. Um, and that's part of, again, the process of building these individuals. When the programming is there, then the next step is demonizing. They'll call it energizing. Okay. Whether they transfer the demonic presence or conjure and put on. Because they have yielded will. They've got yielded human will where the demonic presence can come on. And uh, just like in satanic rituals, they raise the demons. And then, you know, if they've done everything precise, they can command the spirits and target uh, what it is they want done. And this is what's occurred. So inside, if you think in terms of a tree, inside one of these super soldiers where they have many sub-personalities, highly trained, but on many of the branches are... Just think in terms of a, of a of a crow, the idea of a, a demonic presence. What happens is when when that personality comes up forward, the demonic presence manifests through them. And uh, we've learned now how to call it up. When we suspect it there, to call it and command it to come up to engage it. And boy, is that a battle. But you're correct about their use of twilight language, their use of ancient languages, we had one super soldier in the car next to me. I knew it was coming, too, Steve. I can feel the agitation. I finally began to pray inwardly uh, for whatever's there to come forth so we can deal with it. And out of the mouth of this person, they just yelled and cussed and told me to quit it. And I was praying inwardly. Right. I wasn't praying outwardly. And Absolutely. so I kind of smiled, and I began to pray all the more inside. And out of their mouth, they said it again. So I pulled over. I started to pray out loud. They went into, it sounded like Arabic, I don't know, but they begin to 
chant, this weird call, you know, calling out in this language. Then I heard the name Aromain and other names, and they were calling on powers. I began to pray all the stronger. It turned into this like heated little battle till they finally grabbed their head, jumped out of the car, they threw up, and they ran off into the woods. Um, there was power there, and I realized, and, and the Holy Spirit, you know, God has given us the Spirit of God to give us insight, even in spiritual warfare. That's what's important. Jesus gave the disciples the heads up, and he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you. They didn't even know he was in the room. So we, we've got to become more discerning, and then when we deal with stuff, the, the authority of Christ, we don't need to be afraid because that authority decimates them. Uh, if we know our authority, but again, as we've said, three-fourths of the body, they're not trained in, in, in the simple, what I think is the basics of discipleship. Right, and let me ask you this, because this is an email that just came in. Russ goes along with discernment. Steve, please ask Russ if these people are trained to avoid people with the spirit of discernment. I can tell you, uh, go ahead and give your answer, because, I mean, you know, uh, from personal experience, I, I know when you're walking the Holy Ghost, if these entities are are, let's just say this, slightly be below the surface of the control of the will of the person. They'll manifest. I mean, they'll go into, they'll throw uh, absolute uh, convulsions if they have to. Exactly. And, yes, they do. We've had people bring people to the office. The moment they walked in the room, it's like the spirit inside. I mean, they've literally run out, knocked people over. We, we, we've done this so many, I mean, we've seen this happen again and again, well, let alone that they, they do have sub-personalities that are runners, but the demonic side like in the book of Acts, they know. I believe they perceive us usually because they're hidden and they're looking through and they're, they're kind of cloaked. They live in darkness. I think, I think it's very clear they see us and perceive us before, many times before we see and perceive them. But if we are an alert believer, you know, Colossians, you know, chapter 4 tells us to be devoted to prayer and watch. Check out the Greek word for watch. I found one biblical scholar, Kenneth Wiest, said that it has the idea of looking for impending danger. Right. That's a spiritual cutting edge that we can have. And yes, there's times you can look over, and it's like all of a sudden, by the power of the Spirit of God, who is what? Greater, and he's the infinite Spirit of God in us, compared to the finite spirits. We look over at them, when they know that you know, and you know that they know you know, that's when it kind of starts. And the neat thing about the authority is if you can, you know, if they start to get up to run or do anything else, sometimes they, they want to make the person throw up anything to, to, to stop deliverance. We then command them. The bottom line is we have the right to order them. You will not cause this person to, you will not run. You will not use the physical body. When we learn to do that, we, we, we got out of a lot of bad episodes where, you know, we had people throw up or run out or pick up things and throw them, um, because they can be dangerous. Well, yeah, have you had, hey, you've had them come after you with knives. You've been, you know, I mean, yeah. I can tell you point blank that, uh, that one of the spirits, and, and this, I'm, I'm sharing this for us all, along with you so people understand that this stuff is real, okay? And, and you tell your story. I can tell you of a story of, of a girl, okay? Just a, a very nice looking young lady that five grown big guys could not hold down, okay? Yet one little, uh, evangelist named Mary Juarez could command the spirits, and they were afraid of her because of her authority in Jesus. But the big tough guys, you know, I can tell you the big tough guys were so disturbed because they thought, well, you know, I, hey, I can bench press 200 pounds or whatever. This young lady, okay, I was there for every minute of it, she absolutely could throw off 200 pound men as if they were flies. I'm not kidding you. And, and I, that, I agree. I have seen that. So, so the supernatural supercharging, yet at the name of Jesus, with the authority of Jesus. Because look, if we're if we're coming into what we're coming into and facing the immediate period with the presence of Antichrist showing up, then the Spirit of God is going to have to train His people how to fight this battle. Because uh, you're you're being kind, saying ninety percent. I would guess it's more like ninety eight percent of Christians. Number one, don't want to deal with this. And number two, are praying that they don't have to deal with it. And Jesus basically said, it isn't going to happen that way. You're, you're right. And, and, and I've been, again, I've been a pastor 30 years in four churches and preaching many other churches all over state, other states. And, and I love the body of Christ. Jesus, you know, gave his life. And it's true that there's weakness at times and carnality, whatever. But if we follow the training, 
I mean, Jesus modeled it. He commanded us to make disciples, baptize them, and then teach them. Two Greek words. Everything whatsoever he did. And that means from the very beginning how to, how to, you know, how to worship, how to pray, how to, you know, know your, the, the authority in Luke 10, as you've mentioned a number of times. It's in the perfect tense in the original meaning. At the moment of salvation it's given, it abides to this very present one. It's a permanent thing. But it's devastating to the spiritual, the dark side. Devastating. We learned what we called prayer mapping years ago when this big powerful brotherhood or Satanist came out of Pennsylvania. And as they told me information, I went away. And that was when we used to get headaches and things because the sub-personalities inside can be doing warfare against you as you're talking to the main person who looks, who looks harmless. And when we finally discerned and learned this, we begin to show up with prayer, you know, kind of shielding ourselves, but also praying whatever's inside them. We're attacking you back, the demonic side anyway. And we learned also if they go off to their covens, and Steve, you can't realize, I mean, here's what most Christians don't understand. And they are, they are afraid of this, and it's, it's sad that we're afraid whatsoever, but there's, there's, and I've been in law enforcement on, on, and, and I was drawn in to help teach in the academy, everything on cult crime, satanic crime. People have no idea how many covens there are, how, how sophisticated in their, in their development of ritual, conjuring spirits. Here's what they don't know. They're not, these Satanists that we're talking about today, they're not doing it just for their own lusts, though they get that afterwards. They're doing it to conjure powers because they, they know they're targeting churches, targeting pastors. Just like what I call the mother of all rituals in Revelation 16 where the demons were sent out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, targeting the kings for one reason, to supernaturally draw them together. This is a global, we're talking in Revelation 16, a global release, uh, probably the, the apex of, of, of release. Well, in similar ways, covens in cities and places and towns everywhere. I mean, you mentioned the Masons, 53,000 Masonic temples in the United States. And many of these individuals have told us that some of the satanic ritual abuse and stuff, we've tracked them to Masonic lodges and uh, where, you know, this has been used. And, and there's a reason, I think, for those meeting places. They have armed themselves. They know what they're doing. They're, they're, they're getting a hold of counterfeit powers, just like the Word of God says in Second Th- Thessalonians. Counterfeit miracles, counterfeit signs, Every gifting we know in the spirit, they can counterfeit. Every Satanist who had demons deep within subpersonalities, even when it comes to speaking other languages, when demons were kicked out, they could no longer do it. When certain abilities they had to project, to astral project and do warfare that way, when the de- demons were kicked out, they could no longer do those things. Um, so those powers and, and enhancements in humanity, and that's that's why I'm saying there has been and will continue to be a weaponization of these powers. Absolutely um, everything, even the alien powers, you know, in, in some of the giants that are held, and, and you need to hear this because even the most famous Russian eye doctor who is not a Christian, okay, basically says that the psychic projection that comes from the giants uh, that are in stasis, a form of obviously uh, suspended animation, is so strong. And even even to the point, Russ, that... Uh, a gentleman who is now dead, he was a colonel in special operations, told me that when he encountered these things in, in one of the underground uh, oh, command centers out, I think it was in the White Mountains of Arizona or in Dulce, New Mexico, he said that he was under his breath rebuking these little, like, grays, okay, in Jesus' name. And such a commotion rose up that the CO that uh, had, you know, whatever uh, jurisdictional authority over him, even though he wasn't under his command, had him ordered off of the premise, this man who was a Christian believer, because he put the nest, and that's what it's called, of the aliens in such an uproar, rebuking him in Jesus' name under his breath. Now, isn't that a fascinating thing? It is. It shows you the nature. And, and we, could, we again, in all of that, and I think there can be, if, if we as believers will learn that we can even target what's going on supernaturally in the air around us. I think that that warfare, Jesus said when he gave us the authority to trample, literally, again, the picture, the figure of picture is to crush, you know, snakes and scorpions, the idea of crushing the demonic. And then he says, and to overcome, using the word Nike. 
meaning decisive, final victories. We can overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing will harm us. So if we can, if we can train, Steve, thousands and thousands and thousands, we're either going to have to learn it when it all comes crumbling down and we see this manifestation everywhere, because here's what's happened to us in 20-some years. In our little offices, we, we were willing back in the 80s, we'll just take anybody. I don't, we didn't care because we, they, I didn't know where else to, you know, where they're going to get help. So 50 other churches in our city brings to us demonized people. Pastors, I don't, the only thing we said, okay, pastors, you've got to come with them. Or psychiatrists, you've got to come with them. Or law enforcement agent, you come with them and sit in the room and watch what happens. Now, I would rather, like one church has 10,000 members, 18 full-time pastors called me in. We, we did deliverance of this demonic you know, presence in, 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 in these super soldiers that they had sitting in their churches. We, we've done a hundred of them, and they finally call us over to talk. So they're like, they're like well, we see what you believe. You know, you're, you're right on what you believe. The Word of God teaches. Everything else is really great, Russ. Um, we are now going to recommend our people going to you. <laughs> and I said, wait, no. Listen, you've got 18 full-time pastors, multi-million dollar budget, 10,000 people. You do it. And they're like, no, that would split our church. And we could, we just can't, Russ. We, we can't. I was like, how, how can you not? This is a compassion. How can a person get a demon out of them, Steve? Well, how, and, They can't, and, other than the authority of the living Christ. It's a compassionate ministry if we look at Mark 5. It's the real ministry of Jesus. And i got to tell you this. And, and, boy, now you're hitting my uh, go-into-orbit button, Russ. If the Spirit of the Lord is upon us to bind up the brokenhearted, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord's deliverance and set the captives free, then, boy, i got to tell you something. You can preach until you're blue in the face in a mainstream church and absolutely miss the ministry and calling of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why so many sheep are, let's just call it demonized, so many people are under such incredible psychic attacks. I would say, in being on talk radio, I've had... Three to four hundred people that are begging for deliverance and begging for someone to take them serious. And the mainstream churches, look, I'm not, I'm, I'm, let's just say this, the mainstream gathering places of non-believing, supposedly professing Christians, okay, they don't want to touch us. It's interesting. It's okay for Russ or Steve or whoever to get your hands dirty, but boy, we don't want to get our hands dirty. You follow me? Right. It's like that guy on TV, I don't know, some guy that goes and cleans really grubby places. I don't watch TV, but I saw uh, the History Channel or something on it. But I guess the thing that people have got to understand, the power is in the passion, is it not? And I'm talking compassion, the passion of Jesus, and the compassion of setting people free. Sure. And that's, that's part of the issues when I see, because we've had like, a mother brings in her 17-year-old daughter. She's been taken off to this... Wiccan that, that, you know, basically saying, well, we just teach nice, you know, good, whatever, good things. They yeah, white, white, rituals, white magic. Blood rituals, all kinds of stuff. And then they're, they're brought into my office. I'm looking at her. She's completely, I mean, I could see her frozen, basically. And I looked at her and I said, are, are the voices speaking to you? And she shook her head. Um, are they telling you to get out? She shook her head. And her mom's, you know, three feet outside the door. We close the door. My friend and I, my friend sits down. I look at her and just simply say, in the name of the Lord Jesus. I could feel the power of God come down, like expressed. It's almost like it hit her. She went to the ground. This growling voice comes out of this little 17-year-old girl. And we commanded, even the name, the name of it came out, how it got in. We wanted to know how it got in so we can say, hey, this is how you don't let them in no more. And this is the door you have to close. And that's part of deliverance, post-deliverance discipleship. And then for her to learn her own authority and power uh, in Christ. And the mother heard this whole episode, and th- this is this is the sad point. If she would have been taken to you know a psych ward or something, they could have drugged her up psychotropics to stop you know the connection in the brain or wherever it is that she wouldn't hear the voices while the drugs were sedating everything inside, but she wouldn't have gotten rid of anything. Um, so it is. It's it's part because we live in a world that was we as human beings opened up to the fallen cherub. We let them in. They're here. Prophetic revelation says they're going to be here in unprecedented numbers and manifestation in the last of the last days. So we've been given the armament. Jesus said, "I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail." But the, here, you, here's the here's the problem. And again, I've been in the churches preaching. I've been among all, you know. Thousands of believers, we've done a lot of evangelism, but 
even where there's a lot of evangelism in some of the churches, there still is this this thing of, well, uh, you know, we're protected in Jesus. We don't, you know, it's almost like we don't need the armor or the authority. We don't need to go into that because we're protected. That's not what the scriptures teach. Well, right. Isn't that, that would just be the ultimate, and I would call that the ultimate assumption and obviously, you know, the, 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 the cliche of what the first three letters spell in that word. But I think the thing is, is that it's just like uh, we're trying to teach people to prepare for, for the difficult times that are coming and say, well, I'm just going to trust Jesus. I can tell you this, 99% of the people that have said that to me in 36 years of, of being saved by the blood of the Lamb, 98.9% of those people don't practice what they preach in that profession. Jesse Penn Lewis, as you, and you, you mentioned something earlier. Jesse Penn Lewis said the most dangerous point for any Christian is to become passive. And isn't that what hypnosis does? It puts you into such a state of passive, uh, natural, God-given, God-created defenses that other personalities can usurp the authority that you are supposed to have over your own life. Glad you mentioned Jesse Penn because, um, that book, War on the Saints, does bring a, a crucial thing that needs to be brought up again, the passivity. Whether it's Hinduism, Buddhism, when I was, uh, before, I wasn't raised in any church, and I was into deep, you know, occultism, and I was into the temple, this one temple, Buddhist temple, uh, into Golden Buddha, and the master kept telling us we had to go passive. That's what happens among remote viewers now, New Agers, uh, all, all across the board, the passivity. Even this man called Dan Sherman had said that he worked for the National Security Agency, I don't know if you read about him um, in a in some kind of machinery they developed where he was to be connected to receive messages from some kind of extra dimensional presence, but he wasn't allowed to be at, he had to completely go passive. He couldn't question it. He couldn't be critical. He couldn't uh, ask it even questions. It was just he had to be the recipient and be willing to let it come in. That's part of what programming splitting a personality. A, a human's will to it, it literally brings them to zero point pat you know into that passivity to where they can impose the programming that the demonic presence in can literally just you know uh, saturate itself in right set up no shop condition. yeah set up shop you know isn't it interesting because the early sensory deprivation tanks etc were designed to put people into that state so that they could be absolutely programmed with no inhibitions and no uh, no form of natural resistance. So, you know, I, let me ask you this. Have you had any contemporary uh, word from the Lord on why the switch over to HDTV? And, and this is critical because it, it's my contention that they're going to have to put us into a, an electromagnetic passive flux in order for uh, the entities that are going to be released, you know, to have their full authority to just slaughter uh, mercilessly. Are, have you given any thought about that? Here's the thought I've given to that. People have asked me over the years, Russ, what, because we, we've dealt with local individuals where we learned the trigger or another personality inside gave us the trigger and we spoke it. We, we did this in learning. We, we were learning this along the way. And all of a sudden, boom, this personality comes up, you know, you scr- what are you doing? You know, you're not, we're not even supposed to be here. We're, you know, we're not supposed to know these secrets. All this kind of stuff. Now, we've learned what triggers are. They can come on over the phone, just simply tones. They can be sent, uh, just like a dog that can hear a sound and we can't. They also have this ability, you know, and especially the phone. Not just tones, but when we used to hear this little blip of a, of a sound when we did some surveillance. What it was was a microburst, speeded up language in either Chinese or in in like Spanish, some other language that was like a microburst that a subpersonality could pick up and literally kind of download it, listen to it, know what it said. We just thought it was a blip on the phone. Now, when you say this TV thing, yeah, I kept questioning why we're all demanded to move to this. Um, in some of those military ones we've gone over the years, I've real, I mean, we've spent thousands of hours in discussions at lakesides, in buildings, in secret places where they wanted to meet. Uh, scary places, Steve, where we, we had to bring people with weapons because um, we were concerned at that time, back in those days anyway. And we heard them, you know, they talked to us about, I, I said, well, I, I'd ask them, how are they going to release, you know, tens of thousands of you all at one time in this Black Awakening thing, this chaos? 
And they looked at me and smiled. It's two things. It's a spiritual release, demonic presence that literally awakens the sleepers within. But they said, Russ, you know, just simply, you know, tones, the concept of tones. If we, if we have something nationwide that can put out, you know, a particular sound or a set of sounds or a code that all of these individuals are coded by, that's all it's going to take to wake up thousands of them at one time. Or Gwen Towers with mm-hmm. some sonic or infrasonic uh, programming uh, keys. Sure. I, I think, Russ, this is critical, okay, because look at the look at the compression of time. See, I think you just gave everybody the answer, and I, I can't tell you how much uh, uh, emails or how many, forgive me, how many emails I'm getting from people really worried about the AC. What if it, that is the technology for an infrasound, okay, or a carrier signal or a carrier wave. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, Russ quoted the scripture where Jesus would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Interestingly enough, one of the ways the gates are activated are with sound. I do not know the sounds. I don't know, you know, that uh, I was never told that. But uh, the point is, is that sound is the way it's activated. So is it then feasible, Russ, that with the lateness of the hour, and they almost panic like, hey, we'll pay you to do this, that that will be, if you will, the carrier trigger to unloose all of these entities. Uh, yeah, it can be. And I, and I want to say this, it would be a mix, of, because they believe, whether we believe this or not, they clearly believe they can, just like they can conjure a demonic presence and put it on an object, give it to an individual to where that presence begins to affect them, to, you know, like toxic waste almost because that presence has gotten into, you know, into their room or into their home or into their church. They love doing this kind of thing. Well, now to carry this over to technology. Um, I, I have no question that some technology that we have has been given by extra-dimensional presence. Where do ideas come from? They, in a scientist, in a lab worker, you know, in a military lab worker, in, uh, in technicians, they get ideas in their heads. Some of them wake up with dreams that come in their head and they figure something out and they begin to build their piece of technology. I'm convinced, I am utterly convinced, just like those arrows in Ephesians 6 where they're sent into, you know, in against Christians. We understand that as Christians. Involuntary thoughts, you know, thrust into our heads, communicating to us, oh, God doesn't love you, God, you know, you're, you're not going to do good, you're weak, you can, all those lies that come in. I believe the same thing can occur in a person who does not have the Spirit of God or that might even be open to New Age alternative spirituality, that involuntary thoughts, ideas concerning technology that eventually becomes, well, it's all moving global. So I have to look at this and say, I wonder whether there's a connection, where there's demonic, where they know how to put demonic presence in and upon this that will that will be attached to that carrier wave well the the battle is the battle is how should i say this increasing at a magnitude that is just unimaginable would you touch on two you do a series on the abyss and by the way ladies and gentlemen i'll have russ on uh next week if it's okay with you russ i'm not trying to you know commit you to it but there's so much stuff but just talk briefly from your understanding about what happens when the abyss is opened up. Sure, and I've had a number of these individuals that they can't wait for it to be opened up. They, they're looking forward to it. Absolutely, um, but but you're getting you're getting supernatural testimony from the the denizens of hell themselves that the abyss is ready to open. There's an agitation. Is that a good word? There's definitely agitation. Uh, what I've said on this series is the abyss is not the problem. What comes out of the abyss is the problem. Absolutely. And the key, you and I know that the idea of a key is they've gotten the right, the authority somehow. The 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 whether again, just like Satan, the fallen, you know, Satan got the authority to come into the world. It's the Greek word exousia, meaning a temporal but but given authority. Jesus, Satan said it to Jesus. It's been given to me to get, you know, when he was offering all the kingdoms of the world. So he he, this, you know, the, the dark side obtains the right to open this place. Um, I believe, even if it's under the earth, I still believe it's dimensional, but inseparably connected to the physical world. It's just a gateway away. Obviously, there's, it's a gateway. And when it is opened, it, it, it's something that's going to affect the globe. 
the globe is going to know. Now we're moving to global events. All of this will be global. From the time of the Black Awakening, the rise of the Antichrist, everything that occurs is global. And when this place is opened, um, regardless of who, you know, some people say it's the spirits of the Nephilim, it's the, whatever, you listen, I know one thing, even in deliverance, demons, when we said to them, you know, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to come out, and if you're going to give any kind of resistance, we're going to we're going to command you to go to the abyss. Steve, they hate that. They they tremble. Even the demons, biblically speaking, they it's it's shown they don't want to go there. But when that place is opened, and they will get the powers. Now, some of the undergrounders will say we're learning to do this through ritual stuff. They're 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 like they're learning. The, they're tr- they're trying to find the key. They're trying to get this thing opened. Um. And when it does open, and I look at, uh, again, the Greek, it it shows that however they come out, these beings, then it says they come down upon the earth. Absolutely. Absolutely. And And there's the UFO, the UFO, you know, all the the people, and I'll be down in Roswell in a few weeks, all the guys down there, and and all these thousands of UFO followers and, and people that believe in the, you know, new, you know, master race out there in the, in the heavenlies or whatever, this, they're going to come. With, it's going to be the worst nightmare. What they wanted to come down upon the earth, it's going to happen, but it's not going to be what they wanted. No, and, and to serve mankind, the old uh, Twilight Zone episode. Guess what? They're lunch and they're hungry and they're literally, you know, the, the devouring. That's what it says. The, the, that the, the enemy of men's souls goes about devouring whomsoever he can. Sure. And will. Let me ask you this now, too. Based on the agitation and based on the word of the Lord, because you're, you're in the middle of, I would say this, and, and this is, this is, this is, uh, supernatural, the epitome of impure evil, uh, uh, the depths of Satan, but still, isn't it magnificent that the authority, the other word that, that as you know in Greek, and you're the Greek guy, but it's dunamis, which we get the word dynamite from, you can, a lot of people cannot separate the ex- exousia or exousia, exousia from the dunamis and they get confused. They don't understand that Jesus has given them both. It's the, it's the, it's the, their inheritance of the child of the king. So if the devil keeps you dumb, he can keep you on the run or keep you in bondage. Exactly. And, I, and that's why I think you know, the righteous is a bull as a lion. When we know this, even, because it is weird. You, you know, when somebody manifests demonic, I, I, I agree, it's weird, it's scary looking, it is the voice that comes through, the presence, just like we can, you know, when we're preaching or doing stuff, the Spirit of God can manifest presence. We can feel it off of each other as believers. I can feel it in a service, in a revival where the power of God, we've been in a revival where, just like in the old days, the power of God fell. So I know the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, but I also now know, experientially, of the power of the dark side. It's like the opposite ends of those magnets when you turn the wrong way and they can't, they can't touch each other. Uh, they're opposites. That, that's eternal darkness. That's never going to change. There's no reason to give mercy to the dark side. They, they surely have no, no, no means of, you know, mercy. They're not going to change. They don't want to change. Um, they're here for one thing. They'll, just like Mark 5, they'll rip up a human being and use the shreds of humanity left just to manifest. Absolutely. Now, let me ask you this, too. This is a question from somebody else. I have my experience. You'll probably have yours. But somebody wants to know if, and, and I don't think this person, and, and I know this person, he's a friend of mine, will the demons respond to Yahweh or just Jesus? Well, both. I've, I've done both. I, see, for me, I'm just saying my opinion on this right. subject. Uh, there's no separation in my mind. There's right. just simply, I, there's just no question. There's been no, whether I say, you know, like in Isaiah 6, when Isaiah saw the Lord, you know, Yahweh Adonai, and, and, and Jesus. I, I just want to ensure with everybody's mentality on this, that when the Holy Spirit wrote the New Testament, it, it was in Greek primarily, a little bit of Aramaic. So it's very important that we realize, I've never had a demon look at me and say, hey, you didn't use the Hebrew name. Um, so we're talking one of the same, in my view, and no, there's been no difference whatsoever, however I've done it. And uh, you can say Yahweh, knowing that you you mean you know God in human flesh, the Savior, because the roots of our of this authority is the cross, where in Colossians it says that literally Jesus 
you know, triumphed, he made a public spectacle and triumphed over them by the cross. So the, 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 the authority and the right is, is, was won at the cross in a special way. I mean, he had authority when he came. Obviously, he was man- forcing their manifestation, kicking them out all over the place. But at the cross, that extension now is to us. And uh, so I, I've just found no difference, and uh, some said there is, and I just, I, I personally don't see the difference. Let me ask you this, though. The bottom line is is that uh, uh, you found, though, that, uh, have you seen, too, when people are trying to cast out evil spirits, that if they are not clean in their own life, the evil spirits will confront them with a sin that's apparent to the evil spirit? Listen, there, if you want to talk about the source of tele, you know, you know, clairvoyance and telekinesis and psi powers. They, they, they perceive. They, it's like, it, and I felt this in battle with, with them right in front of me at times. You can feel a wave at times of their presence trying to infect you or trying to get into your head. Um, yes, I believe that they can, they can look at a believer. They can, they can smell better than any, you know, rabid dog. They can smell and I don't mean to do that in a, in a disrespectful way, but I mean, they, they, they can smell the fear. Uh, they, they can know what to say. I'll get, you know, I, you know, I'll get your family. Uh, I'll get your daughter. Um, whatever. You know what? Whatever they say, tell them to shut up. I mean, really, honestly, when I say that, um, when we, we have such decimating, uh, to them it's such decimating authority. If we use the authority, it's like a sledgehammer you know, hitting the jelly bean. It, it, it really is. And we've seen them. And when they're commanded and when they're told, you know, I've, I've done this in, in especially with the high-powered, you know, multiples and priestesses and so forth. I'll say, you know, in the, in the context of doing a deliverance, we call it a freedom encounter, because uh, I know the living presence of Jesus is there. I've had demons scream, he's here, he's here in the room. They know he's alive. Even though many people, agnostics, New Age, they all have this other verse... They, the demons know that he's real. They, they, there's no liberal demon. They all know that Jesus is God in human flesh and he's the Savior of the world. They know this, and they know that he's in, in, in the midst of that encounter. And so when they're looking to read or whatever and things are going back and forth, um, there's a lot of things they'll try to do. They'll try to call in other spirits to come in. They'll do all, everything else. But all I know is order them, just like Jesus said. I give you authority. The, the disciples came back and says, you know, that they submitted to us, or like Jesus did. People will say to me, Russ, do I have to go through a 15-hour seminar? Well, we've got those, but no. If you know how to pray and know how, you know, you know you're saved and born in the Spirit of God, and you know you've appropriated, that's what we tell people, the idea of reckoning. Just at least acknowledge what it is you have. That's what Romans 6 says. You know, count yourself dead to sin. Well, why? Because you are. I just said that in the, in the earlier part of the chapter. So I, I tell individuals that the simplest thing is accept the fact that he has given you permanently this authority and be willing and even pray, God, let me use it. And I use that authority in daily prayer just in the sense of the spiritual oppressive warfare around. Right. I, I call it clearing the air, Steve. I think that when we feel things are being sent, because listen, they know occult warfare. They know how to send and target you and, and send the, the hounds of hell against you. And that's a new level of warfare that I think the church didn't have, you know, 30, 40 years ago. They didn't have covens all over or individual members that are targeting you and sending, like, like again, for biblically oriented believers, look at Revelation 16. Hey, Russ, we're out of time on this show, but may I get you back on next week and we'll continue? Oh, absolutely. That'd Thank you. It's too critical. And, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to post this show. Uh, over the weekend, uh, and so you, I understand we went over a couple minutes, and so some of this will be clipped, but for those of you that listen to it on the website, they'll be there. Russ, God bless you. Russ's website, everyone should be on this website over the weekend who knows what's coming down, www.shatterthedarkness, all one word, dot net. Thank you, Russ. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone.